Hey guys, so this video was originally a lot longer, but it had to be cut down for time. The full extended version is available on Patreon, and it has an extra half hour of me and Burke talking about various topics. If you want to check it out, the link is in the description below. Oh man, I didn't even think of how to start this. What's a funny what's what's a funny joke that we can do to to start this Burke? Yeah, I actually I I do have a moderately funny thing. Half Life was the last game I actually played in the Valve set list. Like of all the games that ever came out. Really? Yeah, literally I played Half Life Alex before I played the uh, Half Life. I didn't grow up with it, but you know I had friends who were obsessed with it. And then I played the shit out of it right after Alex. I'm like, you know, what? I fucking should go back and beat the shit out of it. But I did grow up with like Mind of Freeman and shit like that. Freeman's Mind, yep, good old yeah. Ross Scott. Uh, but welcome, Burke. Welcome back to a- another uh, two guys talk about. And uh, last time <laughs> we talked was about a, a completely different game or group of games. It was the the Halo Infinite April Fools video, <laughs> which was pretty eventful, I'd say, very educational at least. I kind of wish I could forget what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> so some funny things about that video, and it's specifically about the comments. Uh, first off, people can't seem to figure out how your name is spelled. I don't know if you <laughs> took a gander at the comments. I, I did take a little perusal, <laughs> but... <laughs> I I have seen so many interpretations of your name, both pronounced <laughs> as Burke or pronounced as Bert or uh, random incarnations. I've seen someone spell it with like a Q. I've seen that. What? Bork. <laughs> like, yes, my son is also <laughs> Bort. <laughs> Bert. Bort. Come along, Bort. Are you talking to me? No, my son is also named Bort. For the record, Burke, how do you spell your name? B E R K. That's it. Some Thank you. people I've heard spells it as B E R K E. But I've I seen that as that. well. Yeah. So first off, that's your name. For people who didn't watch the video and they saw the first ten seconds and thought I was being real, uh, it was a joke. We had a couple people in the comments who did not realize it was a joke. And it was pretty funny to see them arguing with a video that they clearly didn't watch. Oh, that, that's that's priceless. I, I, I think I have too high of a opinion on just people. I, I'm one of those people who's like, you know, like the average person, you know, can figure things they're out. Smart. They're smart. They're smart. And then I see like every every now and then a comment will pop up saying like, how, did, how is Halo Infinite fixed? What did they fix? Nothing was fixed. And <laughs> Dude, watch watch past the first 10 seconds did you get past the the fake ad read did you get past that but yes we're not here to talk about halo uh we are here to talk about uh what i would say is a much better game uh a more a more foundational fps the classic the one and only half-life uh how do you feel about half-life burke have you uh i guess you've only just played it i guess you <laughs> it hasn't been uh a part of you for a while no, I, I, I mentioned it before earlier. Like, it was the last game I played in the series. And it was kind of cool because I did a Half-Life 2 to, like, kind of get myself back into the universe of it, right? Mm. And I was like, whoa, there's a lot of, like, one-to-one -one translations from the games. Like, concepts and enemy types. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, of course, it's Half-Life 1 to Half-Life 2. That Why wouldn't it, it be, uh, like, a one-to-one -one translation? It's just... I, I think it's a good game. I think... Well, most of it. I think there's a section we both agree is awful. <laughs> and it might be the, the failure to stick the landing, as I would call it. Uh, yeah. I, I thought that, too, until I replayed it. Yeah? I, th I think my my peen of it has uh, grown even higher, I think. Like, genuinely. Oh, yeah? It's, uh... I guess to start off, and I'm curious to know, like, if you ever noticed this trend... Where, for a while, Half-Life was always seen as the pinnacle of the FPS genre. Like, just flat out. It's everywhere you looked. It was it was common conjecture on the internet that if there was a singular amazing FPS game, it was likely Half-Life. Maybe Half-Life 2. But over time, I've noticed this. This almost 
kind of cr contrarian viewpoint popping up every now and then. Quite, quite, it got to the point where it was quite regularly like Half-Life was considered, believe it or not, like the downfall of the FPS. And a lot of that had to do with like, you know, mil we had military shooters coming out at the time, uh, games that were focused on heavily scripted areas that were very linear. And it was kind of this idea that Half-Life was the one to spawn them. Which on one hand, I do think is a little unfair. Half-Life wasn't the game to quite do that. There were a few... There are several others. Several <laughs> others, which we might name. But again, it was the it was the opinion at the time of like... Yeah. Because you went from arena shooters to something like Half-Life, which is slower and more story-focused, even though it doesn't have any cutscenes. It's more, uh, I guess, trying to be realistic. A lot of scripting. And I, I noticed this. I'm curious to know if you ever noticed as well, where like this... Not not backlash, but definitely a like general consensus that Half Life had kind of lessened throughout the 2000s and the early 2010s. It was highly regarded, and then all of a sudden you had this kind of downfall. And I think it's still there. I think it's still like people like it, but it's not as highly regarded as it used to be. I'm curious to know if you have noticed the same trend. I've seen naysay against Half Life, which I think is fine. You know, it's it's okay to be like, wow, this thing doesn't congeal to what my what I like in life and I thought that's the, like the heaviest criticism I heard it was never like a, oh it's bad or anything it's just but I'm just speaking of the slower I don't think when I think of like cool intros to a video game Half-Life has one of the coolest I've ever enjoyed yes when you're just on that train going in let's start there the tram level good morning and welcome to the Black Mesa transit system famous for its time just, again, Valve showing off what they could do. The idea that you could have a character moving on. What essentially was a moving piece of geometry seamlessly was insane at the time. And that, mm -hmm. that's kind of why in Half-Life 1 there's that focus on the uh, like like the tram sections. Or like like the on a, on a rail section, which I know some people don't really like. But they were, they, were trying, they were definitely showing off. And what better way to show off than have this slow start to the game. Which makes sense, because the, the game isn't about you being like a space marine dropped into an environment. It's it's like, it's you on your way to work. And there's just a lot of little lines. I love that they showed off like, hey, they, we have radioactive waste. We have machines that do stuff. And then there's that line that lives in my head. Your, the survivals of other may determine on your fitness. Yes. Remember, more lives than your own may depend on your fitness. I didn't notice this until my latest playthrough. That sequence is teasing future levels in the game. You start mm -hmm, off mm -hmm. there, you see an office complex. Literally, it like it looks kind of the same. It's I, I don't think it's meant to be the exact complex that you navigate, but it's you know it's using the same sort of environment and geometry. You've got the offices, and I think even like a little cafeteria area. It's like it's like oh gotcha, we're gonna be there soon. Uh, it shows off again the toxic waste, like the the green the green uh, Simpsons toxic waste, which you go to at another point. Um, there's even a brief area where it shows the outside with with a attack helicopter, maybe the same one that you fight later on in the game. Who knows? There's one area where you see the reactor core, uh, similar to the one with the tentacle, and then I never noticed it. You see the rocket. You see the satellite. <laughs> uh, the one that you fire off into space. It, it's such a neat touch to show off just like, and you don't notice it until you replay the game of like, oh, these are all the, these are the future levels. So um, I thought that was s such a nice inclusion. Realistically, it's probably there because I don't think Valve are working with a lot of textures and assets. So they're probably like, we have to reuse what we got, uh, but still cool nonetheless. And very, very different for an FPS game at the time. Just a slow atmospheric intro. And then you get out of the tram, and it's like, oh, running late, Gordon? Like, even the game's like, we get it. You probably want to get moving. It's, yeah, it's it's a very just atmospheric intro. And just as part of an atmospheric game as well, where it's, it's emphasizing that you are just a normal guy. You know, you're a normal guy in extraordinary circumstances, but you are just a normal guy. Your name is Gordon Freeman, like... A, you're a theoretical physicist who just happens to be in the wrong place at the right time, you know? I just love what you can do in that intro, because even out of the tram, you can fuck with, like, the break room. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Like, when you actually get in, like, you can go, you can turn off the guy's computer and shut down his server. Or you can uh, spoil the guy's the food in the microwave. My God, what are you doing? 
you can go into the locker room. Coincidentally, all the scientists seem to be named after Valve employees. I always, I'm always, <laughs> I always see Laidlaw's locker. I'm like, oh, oh, Mark Laidlaw, you may you rest in peace, even though you're not dead. <laughs> He's in a better place now. Yeah, it's 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 hard to re it's hard to like revisit Half Life when you kind of know that. I guess it used to be hard. Uh, it, used, it used to be hard knowing like that Half Life Three would probably never happen. Knowing like all these loose threads would not really go somewhere. Although now with Alex, there there is that little hope. There's a little bit of hope that this might actually lead somewhere. Oh, it it is rough because I I grew up actually on two because mm. that was what got me into gaming. Uh, at least like PC gaming. That was the big segue where I was like, oh, I got my GameCube. What is this? <laughs> yeah. Um. I'll talk. I'll, we can talk more about that later. Because yeah. again, I think we'll loop ha- back to it. Ha- like Half Life had a similar role in my life as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and getting mm-hmm. into PC gaming. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. But yeah, going back to that intro, so amazing. Like, the test chamber. Like, that is one of the most iconic openings to a game. You know, it, it things start to go wrong. It's all of a sudden the scientists are dying. Things are teleporting in and you just hear, like... Chaos. The, uh, the, the chaos. And then there's that, like, amazing part where... Because obviously the game is, is transitioning between multiple levels. So you're, you ter- you're teleporting around and then it just pauses and you hear Gordon's breath just breathing. Then you're, you're right back into it and it's like, oh, now the game started. Now it's like, now it's the real deal. And even then, it's a very slow start of just, you don't even have a gun. You're relying on a security guard with a gun at first. Um, then you find, a, you find the infamous crowbar. <laughs> I still think it's single-handedly the most iconic melee weapon. It is. It is. It's like probably right behind it is like the uh, the system shock wrench, you know. Which again is is another neat touch. Like Gordon is not a soldier. He's a guy who <laughs> was in an accident. And now he's trying to pick up whatever he can, including a crowbar. That opening, those opening levels, like even when you get a gun, it is genuinely like. It, it is to me that is some of the best like FPS content in any game ever. It is it has the perfect amount of horror, the perfect like atmosphere and ambiance. The the gameplay really starts to take off like when you're trying to you're managing your ammo. You know you can like the headcrab zombies like you, the first encounter with them. It's like what the fuck is going on? Given how prolific headcrabs are now, it's it's yeah it's hard to. It is kind of hard to regain that like initial horror that people felt when they first saw it. Like that, you see that one guy gets his head crab right on his head, and it's like, oh shit, these things are scientists. Like they're taking over their bodies. And then like how the stomach becomes like a mouth. That always yeah, freaked me out. Yeah, so, it's such a cool enemy design. And then you start running into all the different aliens. Uh, just a very those, again, I'm, I'm kind of skipping through stuff, but those first few levels, like genuinely, that is some of Val. I think some of Val's finest work. I think that's what I love with Half-Life. Like, I, I do like Half-Life 2. Half-Life 1 has a very good just ramp up. It it starts so slow and then it just starts going up and up and it does not stop until the end of the game where you think you get a reprieve and then it's it's like nope, it's even it's even more off the rails. <laughs> this is an incredible game in the sense of its scope, its humor, and I love the weapons. Like, nice. I, I want to talk about the weapons because well, go ahead, I yeah. loved the, the bugs. I fucking loved the bugs. They were <laughs> the gross, bugs. and you just unleashed them, and they go get you. And I'm like, this is my fucking jam. The uh, the bee gun. <laughs> it's it's a gun that fires bees. Why would an alien race invent them? Who knows? You know what? I'm gonna say I I, I do know a lot of people who who talk about how dated the combat is, and it, it is a little dated. But again, having just revisited it, it's like. It really holds up. Gunplay's tight. Gunplay yes. has always been tight. Gunplay's good. Movement is good. Very and good. And once you actually get good at the um, like bunny hopping or the crouch slide jumping, there's some incredible movement tech in that game. It's... Granted, you have to take the tutorial sometimes <laughs> to figure that shit out. Yeah. Again, it was, it was the game that taught people how to crouch jump, except for Dark Side Phil. You could never figure it out. <laughs> it's yeah, The combat is great. It's specifically when you encounter those first Marines. Oh, the way they fucking pivot. It's and they move. they move so fast. Like, I, I could I can only compare them to like the fear replicants, you know? Like Yeah. They are aggressive and they talk. 
and they radio into each other and it genuinely like they are an unnerving enemy to fight which is ironic because they are the humans like they're the one enemy in the whole game that are other humans and yet they're trying to kill you my pulse goes up during any of the military section parts just because they just when they move it's like if you're not used to playing on a pc game with the like the, the flick it's uh and like going from you know like head crab zombies to fucking even like the vortigons like the vortigons are like easy telegraphed attacks you get to the marines and they're just like they're fucking they're strafing they're running to cover they don't just charge you if they'll try to relocate like they'll run between different areas it's insane to see and it's it is a testament to how well designed their ai is that like even over 20 years later it still is unnerving and it still is some of the best ai like i've seen in a first person shooter they also got a lot of personality between the different sections when you stop to hear what they actually have to say yeah as limited as the Half-Life dialogue is. Their radio red versus blue voice. Yeah. <laughs> All I know for sure is he's been killing my buddies. Oh yeah, he'll pay. He will definitely pay. Now I love, I, hey, like the voice acting like, is another thing we can talk about. Very good. Even, even for what it is, it's very solid. Freeman, right? I've got a message for you. Make sure you don't... Oh! I, I think a lot of people don't realize, like, how far acting has gone in video games. Hey, Burke, did you know that all the scientists are voiced by, like, one guy? I bet you didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's heading for the service, but I think they're crazy not to stay put. Someone is bound to come by and rescue us. Quite a few handsome specimens were collected from the border world and brought back this way. Before the survey members started being collected themselves, that is. But it's good. It's like it's genuinely good. And again, you're mentioning the humor. It, the humor doesn't distract from the core of the game. It doesn't distract from the story because the story is it is genuinely like horrific. It is Half Life. Yeah. You know, we meme. It's memed about. We have Gary's mod. We have Source Filmmaker. It's. I think it's lost on people just how horrific of a world and story this is. It it is one of those moments. Also, like. You know, because the first time the tentacle boys show up, I forget what they're called, the, yeah. the ones on the ceiling, and you see the first guy get hit on, you're like, uh-oh. Oh, shit. Or, like, the uh, the elevator. Oh, God, th that scream <laughs> I, does. I don't want to die. It's it's horrific. I Even to this day, I feel bad that I can't rescue those people. Or the guy hanging off the ledge. My favorite is always the scientist that jumps through the window, though. Yeah, I yeah. I know. And they will confidently turn to you, and you're like, "Hello, uh, <laughs> hello." I, I love, I love that. Yeah. Amazing. I think it's because amazing lip sync. It, it's a, yeah. I think part of why I think Half Life is very funny to some people, even though it's like you said, very horrific, is because horrific things can happen, and then to like, hello, Gordon, <laughs> just like. Out of nowhere. There is a little bit of there's a little bit of comedy sprinkled in there. Yeah. I do think most of the comedy stems from, you know, Gary's mod and just memes. Yeah. Valve games are very memeable. Half Life is no exception. I, I know I'm jumping a little bit, but I will always remember that when you get to the tentacle box, the actual the one where you have to throw the grenades to distract oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how I did it. There's the one guy that's like, be quiet. If we make noise, it'll attack us. And then the next day, suck on this, you squid. And then just get fucking yeeted into the atmosphere. You're like, there, like, you're trying not to laugh. There is one part. I, I love that boss as a concept, as annoying as it can be. I, 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 re uh -huh. I actually really like that whole area. And you have all like the, the orbiting rooms and the platforms. Like that whole area, I love. I love the look of that. Uh, but one thing that always bugs me is when the tentacle grabs the guy and pulls him in. His body is never quite synced to the arms. So you, it, the tentacle always flies back, and then his body is always just floating after it, quite a little bit out of sync. And it, oh, I, God. I, know, I don't think I can unsee it. I know it's happening, but I always, like, it always bugs me. And the re I imagine the reason it's happening is because, again, this is 1998. It is two separate animations being played around the same time and some poor guy has had to go through and change like second by second to try and line them up and then it's it's very clearly like it's like okay we can't be bothered to make them in sync just leave it as is it always reminds me in a halo comedy evolved 
at the very first level, there's Master Chief meeting keys, and they shake hands. And that's two different animations. Those are two different animations that Bungie could not figure out how to get playing, like to connect to each other. So what it's literal, what they've literally done is they would go in and out, moving the models as closely as they could, and trying to play the animation so it would line up perfectly. I know how the sausage is made. I'm I'm just goofing, but that that lives in my brain rent free. Well, it also it is it does make you wonder because like like I said with like the voice acting and everything pre 2000 game development. So much shit wasn't figured out still. Yeah. Um. Then so much shit wasn't appreciated, like voice acting or well synchronized animations. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. It's it was genuine work. And then how do we know how long the development cycle for Half Life was? Because I remember apparently it was shown off in like '97. Or it, I think it was supposed to even come out in '97 too, but obviously it was pushed back. So even like among games at the time games that would have like a year turnaround I, th- I think half-life was kind of special for that it was, it was running off the quake one engine there's a reason why that game is very polished and valve games in general are very polished everyone jokes about valve time everyone jokes about like fucking it's like you know valve will say a game will come out this year and it'll come out a year later it's like it's like first off when's the last time you played a game made by valve that launched like cyberpunk Valve's always been consistent. Valve has moderate jank when it comes to like AI, but the general gameplay experience has always been so tight. Yeah, because you know? they spend so much time trying to refine it in the first place. There are like, with Half-Life games alone, there is at least like half a dozen canceled Half-Life projects. And everyone everyone talks about like, it's like, oh my God, like Half-Life Return to Ravenholm. You know, that's that was that was one of the games I think was being made by um, uh, Arcane, like the... Uh, the Dishonored and Prey team, um, who are now famous for their amazing game, Redfall. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were going to make a like horror Ravenholm prequel game, but it you know, never came out. And everyone, people are always like, oh my god, could you imagine if they actually made one of these games? And I think people forget, like, first off, so many games are canceled. So many games are just spent in development hell and never see the light of day. And Valve specifically, they do have a, they have a very strong sense of like quality assurance. And because they are a private company, because they're not beholden to stockholders or people who just happen to own shares of the company, so now they dictate how the company's run, they are not beholden to deadlines. They're not beholden to like, we have to get this Half-Life game out by, you know, Christmas. It's, it's, you know, they're not feeling the game. We're just going to push it back a year. It's ready when it's ready. Ready when it's ready. Which ironically was the tagline of Halo MCC, <laughs> which just never was, oh, was no. never ready. <laughs> but that's its own other video. But yeah, it's they their games are just insanely polished. And I think an, another thing that has to do with it is it it's not just polish, it is standards. And I think mm. that in partial, like that is a partial reason why Half-Life 3 has not, not been made. Because I don't think Valve are simply satisfied with just releasing the same game again. Like, as people would want Half Life 3 just to be like Half Life 2 or even Half Life 1. In my opinion, it was a very one to one translation. Half Life 2 just had, hey, look what new tech we can throw in. Going from Half Life 1 to Half Life 2 is a huge leap. Again, it's maybe if you're playing them back to back, you don't really see that. But, like, again, like, you, you know. The maps are huge. The the physics, the physics, the engine. It's a complete. It's the source engine. You're going from like a Quake era engine to fucking source. I think in in part like the reason why they decided not to do the episodic Half Life series was because I think they knew the games would all just start to blend together. Like their games would just be like again. Episode two added stuff. Episode one added stuff. All in all, it's all just one package. Like when people play Half Life two, they play all of those. They play it all together. Mm-hmm. I think Valve know that. I think that's why something like Half-Life 3... Like, it took until VR to be as robust as it is now for them to even make another Half-Life game. And they made Alex. And Alex was just them flexing, in my humble opinion. Valve have this idea that they have to push themselves as hard as they can. That's why they cancel so many projects, because they're just not satisfied with this. Anyway, so I've, that was a long tangent. We can get back into Half-Life 1. Continued employment in the Black Mesa... Re- We're talking about, I think, aspects of the game that make like Half-Life iconic and the next thing I can really think of that's not the enemies the humor 
is just G-Man. Like, if you keep your yeah. eyes open, he just casually just shows up out of places. And it's like, who, who is that man? And we still don't know. We still do not know what G-Man is. It's, I think people assume, people have accepted he's probably an alien. Likely an alien beyond both the Combine and the uh, the residents of Zen. Probably something else. But yeah, it's this creepy little presence. You start seeing him. It's like... It's like, oh, this this guy's monitoring you, and then you get to the end of the game. It's like, oh, this is so. This was all leading to something. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. I guess yeah. Going to aspects that that I remember Half Life for, the environment and specifically level design and puzzles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is where we got the term Valve Puzzle. They have a very specific way in making their games, or specifically designing their levels, and I'm always I'm always fascinated by it because I've noted I've noticed it in ha in the other Half Life games. I've noted noticed it especially in like Left 4 Dead, where the way they can construct a linear pathway but add like just the right amount of depth to it, where you know that you're going in a singular direction, but it still feels like you're kind of just in a maze, but you're never, you're never fully in a maze. I know famously like one of the inspirations for Half-Life, it was uh, Gabe Newell was playing Doom and he got really scared of it. He was really terrified, but like comparing Doom to Half-Life, like Doom is a game where, you know, the action's great. I'm talking about original Doom, uh, which I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate what Doom is. It is a hard game to play because the game is a fucking maze. It is a real maze and it's not, it's not full of action. It's you kill a, a bunch of enemies and then you're kind of just wandering this maze for a while. Yep. You know, by the time you get to, I, th I do think Quake probably has the best level design. Like it's all very like looping and loops back and you're, you're never quite lost in Quake the same way that you would be lost in a Doom level. You can stumble into a secret ending, a secret area that gets you in with a grenade launcher and shit like that. But Half-Life, it was, you know, it taking these levels and kind of streamlining them being like okay we don't need a fucking we don't need a weird maze level we just need to keep the player knowing where they're going even if they have to go to multiple places with with the exception of maybe one area which the uh <laughs> I, I i i think this game's levels even some of the levels that people don't like like they're all pretty solid like again i don't hate on a rail i don't even hate zen all that much we'll get to that later the one level that i <laughs> do not like because it reminds me of every boring uh, like late 90s fps game is the level where you're going into the reactor and you are turning levers doing this and that and is just constant backtracking and you constantly getting lost i've never liked that part of the game it's always the part of the game where i'm worried i'm just going to shut it off I will admit there's something I personally love about Half-Life. It's the audio design. Mm. The world feels very... When you're near a reactor or anything that has like a machine that's moving, you kind of hear it going. Yeah. Yeah, like the humming of generators. And I just was like, man, it's really an auditory delight to just hear you go through the game. Burke, what did you think as someone who has played... Who's someone who's been spoiled with Half-Life Alex? What did you think about the visuals? OG visuals? I mean, it's a 98 game. <laughs> I mean, it's a Quake game, and I personally don't hate on those graphics. I actually find them quite charming. Me too. To watch the bad lip syncing. <laughs> um, How dare you? you that, know, that lip syncing is state of the art. It, I mean, it that is. lip syncing is literally <laughs> better than certain modern AAA games. To whom? And your goddamn father. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. There are some times when um, the spitter enemies, when you're out in the silo, where it's like the gray on green, it really fucks with my vision. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. With I didn't, my, I didn't even think with about my that. color vision. So I just start getting hit by shit. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, there, there are some things, but like I said, for me, I'm a, it's more auditory for me. I can overlook a bad visual game. In fact, who's the guy who makes all those quake shooters? Uh, oh, God. There's a, there's a million of them now. Burke. No, no, they got like. <laughs> <laughs> the one where you can do like the dual uh, lever action shotguns. Um, you're talking about Dusk. That is uh, yeah. David Samantha. I can. Oh, thank you. It and Iron Lung and shit like that. I believe. Right? Yes. Yes. I can. Bad graphics, quote unquote. It's not a bad thing. They're very charming in my eyes. As long as you can accurately convey the thing, because I love the the yelling puppies. I don't know what they're actually called. The uh, the hound eyes. I love those things. I think they're so fucking cute. The little three legged. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you're like, hey, what's that thing? <laughs> oh, my fucking ears. 
uh, li 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 neat little touches. I love all the the alien designs are all really good. But like going back to the graphics, yeah. I adore how this game looks. And it's funny because like like something like Half Life Two, I'll fully say like I don't hate how Half Life Two looks. It it I think I've been ruined by other Source Engine games. I've seen like those exact assets be completely overhauled but i don't get that from half-life one i still play half-life one and i'm still like the visuals again they're they're dated but they're not without their charm and i i really i really get into it i that like those those underground facilities they have such a good atmosphere the the glowing green goo or the uh the inside of the offices like i love those designs i love how that area looks or like when you're out on the surface and it's all bright and sunny I think it's a color thing. Yeah. Looking through it. Because Half-Life 2 gets a little washed, is what I always say. But I don't, I, don't, like how I don't mind how that is. To me, it's not even a matter of just the colors. It is, which usually it is. Like, usually I am a big stickler for colors, which with Half-Life 2, it's just that, I don't know. I felt the environments were a little barren, which I understand why. It's a 2004 game. They're using an engine that they know a lot of computers won't even be able to run, so they are trying to optimize it. But it's, it's, it's having seen, like, other games use the engine. Like, like something like Portal, for example, or like Portal 2. Yeah. Or like Left 4 Dead. Like, seeing a game actually utilize it, or even, you know, even Team Fortress. Seeing that, it, it makes playing the original Half-Life 2 a little, a little barren looking. But I don't get that for Half-Life 1, which is ironic because a lot of the charm I have for the game's visuals are similar to, like, Half-Life 2, where it's... Its textures and assets were reused in so many other games. Day of Defeat, Team Fortress Classic, Counter-Strike 1.6. <laughs> Those, like, early Counter-Strike maps are literally set in, like, Black Mesa facilities. Like, they are, like, they're set, like, within the canyons, within those sunny desert cliffs. I, I find so much, there's so much charm to that. It, again, it, it's so funny seeing just how primitive the tech was, but seeing how they were getting by with so little... Um, two of my favorite things that have to do with how this game, how graphic stuff that like kids these days, I hate to say it like that, will have no concept of what it used to be like. For example, in the elevator, you see that light flashing as you're going up to a different level and it's just an animated texture, but the texture is so compressed every different frame. You can see the, the noise change. Like the whole texture is just this like... <laughs> It's I I'll have to show it, but it's just like it's so novel. I love that. I again like that's how they had to do textures back in the day. They were heavily compressed. Or another favorite little texture is how the lights have little. Uh, they've they've got like moths flying around them, and that is just an, an another animated texture that they had to put turn into a sprite, and they just had to put on like every light source they could fit it on. Like again, really novel stuff like that that you wouldn't even think of today. Just Valve using all the tech that they had to try and make Half-Life as good as they could. My brain is focused on how hard Gordy can fucking push boxes. <laughs> even if it's a little janky. Yeah. Half-Life 1, I don't know, it just controlled better than 2. And I think but I think it's also because 2 had to do more shit. Yeah, I I do love the way Half Life feels. You know, Wasad wasn't even a fully accepted step format for FPSs still then. Quake was genuinely like one of the first games to be like, okay, WASD and mouse look. And even then, I don't think it was that standardized. It still had buttons for you to <laughs> to look up and down and uh, side to side with. So this might be me flexing my my internet history a little bit. You know, they had Quake tournaments back when Quakes were coming out. And one guy was accredited for winning the tournament because he used a WSASD setup before it was standardized. I mean, he should have, but it was just one of those, like, that just shows you, like, how what we consider to be industry standard today is still, like, bleeding edge. And one thing about Half-Life I loved in its bleeding edgeness was how many new ideas or little scenarios you had to do and how frequently appeared and then how frequently you could just move on from that concept but then reuse it later in a new fun way. Yeah, it's, uh... Because again, with Half-Life, I do think most of the development, as is the case with a lot of Valve games, is the majority of that development time is spent on the core mechanics, not really on just content. That A lot of modern games, it's let's get as much content out as we can, even if the core gameplay fucking sucks or just isn't there. So with Valve, you have you get these core mechanics 
and then they build the game around that. You have these, you have levels that will center around a certain mechanic. That's again for like, if there's a level that you don't like, once you're done with it, you're kind of done with it. Now you're on to a new set piece. And there are so like, there are so many amazing set pieces. The one that always comes to mind is when you're out on the surface and you're, you're first, you're fighting with the attack helicopter. And then, uh, okay, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember the order of events here. There's the dam area and then you have to deal with the tanks that are shooting at you. At the time, fucking incredible design. Like, it's, it's something we take for granted because everyone's played Call of Duty and everyone knows like, oh, this is just a helicopter. It's just a tank shooting at you. Which by the way, little touch that I love. You can go into the game's level geometry, the like the actual um, level file. Those tanks are the part of the level. It's their turrets that are like added on afterwards. The active components. So like <laughs> that, the level is literally has the tank built into it. Like th that's how primitive the tech was at the time. That's also beautiful though, just to see like how they could get around what limitations they did have. Yeah. And in a way it's what kept the game focused. Cause like you can't have, you can't, you don't have feature creep. You very clearly know what your engine is capable of doing capable and of. not doing. Yeah, there's there's a lot to love with just how novel some of the game's ideas are. I think I, it's just it always comes down to like the cultural impact of Half-Life for me. You went from Quake and Duke Nukem and Shadow Warrior and Doom and all the Doom clones, and then you went right into Half-Life, this game that was slow. And the the concept, going back to levels, the concept of a level was changed in Half-Life. It wasn't just this arena that you spawned in and you had to like navigate. It was like they led into each other. Half-Life is this linear journey. It's this seamless like path that you take, which was incredible at the time. But yeah, it was genuinely such a different experience from what was on the market at the time. And I guess it kind of, I guess before before we get towards the end of the game, I don't know if it's worth bringing up some of the other games that were out at the time that were trying to do the same stuff Half-Life was doing. And I'm curious to know if you're thinking of the same game as I am. That's it. I, to be honest with you, I'm really lackluster in FPSs of this era. So Quake 2 was a big influence where you play Quake 2 and it's very clearly like, oh, this is where they got some Half-Life stuff from. Down to like you going between levels and like re-navigating them, like going through loading screens, like in backtracking. A game that came out the same year, I'm curious to know how close it actually came out. It was like, I want to say it was genuinely within like a month or two. Like it was right next to Half-Life. It was a little game called Sin. No. Um, literally the same oh, year. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I would not have guessed that by the way, but I know immediately like, oh God. And when you think about it, they were doing the same thing. They were trying to take the arena FPS using the same engine too. They were also using the Quake engine and trying to make a more story focused, cinematic, kind of linear, kind of more scripted game. What's funny is everyone points to Half-Life as being the father of the modern FPS. No one looks at Sin, even though Sin really should be. Sin is Sin is the example of how to, <laughs> of, how, of what, actual modern FPSs are like. With actual cutscenes, Sin is literally like the first FPS game I can think of that has a helicopter gun turret sequence. But uh, an another thing Sin is, I, I don't know why I'm ragging on Sin, it's a good game, but another funny thing about Sin, and I don't know how versed you are with Sin history, Burke. Please educate me. S so Sin obviously lost the fight with Half-Life. Specifically, Sin launched in a very buggy state. And that was back in the day where even though they released a patch for it, a lot of people did, either didn't have internet or they had internet, but it was dial up. Meaning that, you know, a fucking like a patch that takes like a couple megabytes, like that's that's a whole day. Like that's an entire day of day of your internet data and with data that you'd probably don't even want to pay for. So people just didn't bother with it. So word of mouth spread that Sin was this fucking broken glitchy game. Ross Scott made a really good video about it. I don't know why I'm trying to <laughs> retell it, but long story short, Sin died because it was trying to be a modern FPS. It like Sin is the, it is the poster child for the modern FPS. I find it ironic how Half-Life, Half-Life is given the blame, even though it's like, no, there's- It killed the actual competition that made it. it. Yeah. I find that fascinating. And no one, no one acknowledges this. No one acknowledges that two games released the, like in the exact same time, one destroyed the other, but the other seemed to be the one whose legacy lived on with every other game copying it. Not to mention, amazing game, amazing speed run, which is more my turf. 
Yeah, it's and you know, if, I'll be honest, like I respect how speedruns are made. I'm never gonna be a speedrunner. I I savor my food when I eat it. Like I I play a game. I'm just immersed in the world. It's, I'm not I'm not set out to beat it. I'm set out to just have fun in it. Which is why I don't think I could ever <laughs> speedrun a game for the life of me. I actually would agree with you on this one. I. I personally can't enjoy the speedrun. It's one of the few I can't enjoy a speedrun because I'd rather just play it the way it's intended to be played or play it intelligently or just bullshit with infinite ammo and homing <laughs> rocket launcher that you can click and draw at someone. It's funny. Half-Life's core design, it's simple, but it's one that like you can you see pop up every now and then. It's a, it's a game design that I really love where it is an element of ammo management and weapon management but it's slow and methodical you're you know you're slowly getting more ammo you're slowly acquiring weapons enemy fights are brutal but they're like they're interspersed like a lot of the game is dedicated to you exploring the environment i've always i've always thought that it's it's ironic that half-life was inspired by doom because i've always thought that doom 3 specifically was heavily inspired by half-life to the point where i've almost considered like doom 3 to be just id trying to make their own half-life game because in a way it's it's essentially like the same formula weird i've always thought doom 3 was they was the company the, you know, these programmers like being like all right i see i've i've put all the basic components in here it's time for me to make like my magnum opus, at least in terms of game design. If you're like a D&D dungeon master and you've learned to use each individual tool and how you can blend it all together and make this part bigger than it. That's how I've always interpreted Doom 3. And you're like, oh, it's I, I just like your interpretation. I've never heard that one. Mm. I mean, it's just the, it's the same. It is. It's like it, Doom 3 to Doom doesn't track, but Doom 3 to Half-Life really does. And they're really similar to each other. Now that I'm thinking about it, it was a game where the environment was just as much of a focus as the enemies. If oftentimes even more so. I would argue far more so. Going back to it, going back to revisit it, it's something I never noticed, you know, playing it as a kid. But now as an adult, it's like, that is why the game is genuinely, like, it holds up. And just, yeah, I, I love the gameplay formula. I love the combat loop. Playing it make, makes me realize, like, why people want more Half-Life games. Because, like, the, it's, this formula is great. It's just a matter of actually, like, nailing the level design, nailing the pacing. I have, I cannot think of another game in terms of ammo conservation or that satisfaction of having said ammo conserved and then using your power weapons to, like, just eke by in a very intense firefight than old school Resident Evil games, actually. <laughs> I've always thought, like, I want to, I'm curious to know if you're going to agree with me. There's a little bit of survival horror in Half-Life. Like, especially those, Absolutely. especially those early parts. I've always thought, like, as far as direction could go, like, you could make just a flat out Half-Life survival horror game or a horror survival horror game with the mechanics of Half-Life being that the, the, the weapon collection, the ammo collection, stuff like that. Something a little more streamlined. You know, as opposed to Resident Evil. So the, the only major difference, really, between survival horror classic, which is what I'm going to call Silent Hill, Resident Evil, and anything down those older school of thoughts in Half-Life, is that Half-Life, you can carry all the tools you could possibly need. Yes. Well, because it's, you know, it's an FPS game. It's an FPS game coming off yeah. of Quake and Doom. I think Half-Life even successfully did that at one point in Half-Life 2, if you ever did uh, Raven Home with just the gravity gun. Yes. Yeah, that that is the definitive Half-Life horror experience. I guess I'm talking about them making a Half-Life horror game. We literally talked about the, uh, the Raven Home canceled game. I mean, I would love it, and especially with, like, headcrabs, if you treated it the way Alien Isolation treats facehuggers, yes. would be such a game changer. And I'll say... And I, I, I did notice this when replaying it, is as you get confident with an enemy, the game will know to spice it up. And it's like, oh, you're, it, you think that you're, you're smart just killing head crab zombies and head crabs and all these little aliens. Uh, here's the U.S. military, you know, or like, <laughs> oh, oh, you, th you think you've countered the U.S. military? Well, here's a, here's a bunch of alien soldiers. Like it, it keeps stepping it up and raising the bar. And I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about the cosmic elephant in the room. <laughs> Uh, also known as Zen. Burke, I just want to ask, what did you think of Zen? Fuck Zen. Really? Uh, it, oh, it, again, this is just comes from more of the shift in perspective and how it's used. I just had a hard time seeing shit, man. 
Oh, I didn't even consider that. Oh, yeah, you would have. I had such a hard time seeing what the fuck was going that on. That murky, green, brown <laughs> platform that you have I to got between. so goddamn lost. Or, like, you know when you get warped by the cosmic baby in those pools? Oh, God. Yeah, that part's never fun. <laughs> But, like, for me, it was just, like, what is going... I, I can't... What? Like, I had to fuck with my color. I had to do a lot of... To, like, see what I was doing. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it is just orange and green, isn't it? <laughs> it, it was pain. So, fuck Zen is my official statement. Yeah, I, going back into Zen, because Zen is always considered the worst. From a design perspective, it is very cool. Conceptually, I love it. Half-Life has such a weird sci-fi universe, but I really love it. I love, and I love how weird it is. To me, I will always remember Zen. And we're, I mean, we're not even talking about another dimension. We're talking about the weird stuff in between dimensions. It is a border world. And this the concept of this these collection of aliens all you know controlled by this hive mind by the nylanth and they've tried to colonize this border world but they're all just kind of held up there and that's why they're coming to earth is because they need somewhere to live which is then you know in half-life 2 we learn what they're actually running from which is i've, I've always wanted to know whether or not that was does, that was part of the story from the get-go because the nylanth himself he's he's covered in these like scars and these like metallic cyborg body like he's very clearly escaped from some combine facility and that's why he's running. But I love all that. I love just how bizarre the world itself is. There's areas, it's like, you're, you're like, you know, like in a nebula. And then there's one area where it's like this reflective pool. And you're like, there's like two suns, but it's clearly like a mirror. It's like, what is this? Um, and there's an area where it's like just a bunch of floating amoebas. It, it's, again, it's such a cool concept. I think it is let down in the pacing and the level design. Clearly what happened was they want, Valve wanted to make these levels completely different from the rest of the game well they certainly succeeded in their grays and greens <laughs> well again even even replaying it like i didn't hate it as much as i usually did but that could have been just i might have been in a good mood i don't know i never liked the nylanth fight i've always struggled with that do you mean airtime simulator <laughs> Or just like trying to get above him and him teleporting you right before you can get a shot off. Can you get above the yeah. baby? It's, I think the problem is the boss is a little too complicated and the whole Zen area goes on for a little too long. I think they could have. You even, know what? That's it. That's it. It's that. There are parts of the levels that aren't that bad, but it's in between these like weird, long, just empty puzzle areas. It's also such an odd monkey wrench because the rest of the game, the concept never sticks around for too long. You know, they made those assets. Like, I imagine Valve would want to at least utilize them instead of just showing them off once and not using them again. But a part of me wonders whether or not the length is just a result of the their poor design or if it is genuinely as long as it feels. I'm just thinking about the amount of missed jumps I made. <laughs> yep. And I think that's what also feeds into it is that, true, you got this great new concept. Oh, you messed up your jump. Guess who's going back? I think it is because Half Life is a very timeless game, and then it's you get run into that area, and you're like, "Oh, this game was made in 1998." Like it, it, it that... suddenly it hits you. It suddenly just hits you. <laughs> the rest of the game is so tightly crafted, and you get to Zen. It, 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 apparently, it is, there's just an FPS trend for whatever reason. The a game always just kind of dies by like its third act, where those those last levels are usually the worst. And I've always I've always thought that m the thinking is that if you imagine like the amount of people playing your game, there's a good chance that like only a small percentage of them will even make it to the end. Like that's just how people play games. Dude, Steam achievements is the ultimate proof of that. So I always I always find it funny where as you play a game, it's like those first levels are the most polished and like that is what everyone remembers. And then you get to the end of the game, <laughs> the end of the game 
and it is just weird nonsense. The the one game I always remembered going talking about Ross Scott again is the uh, uh, Fahrenheit or um, the Indigo Prophecy. If you remember that gem of a game, where it is David one. It was not David Cage's first game, but it definitely was his the one that I think made him super popular because then he would go on to make uh, Heavy Rain. Everyone knows oh God. everyone knows that game as the like crime detective snow game where it's like it's snow in New York and you're like going back and forth between these two characters. But what's funny is I've always I've heard so many people talk about how that game opens. I've never known how that game ends because it ends with like a matrix style like interdimensional like I think time traveling race of people coming to like destroy the planet and you're like kung fu kicking and jumping everywhere. What? And you're, you're like resurrected and brought back to life and there's like you're going in between dimensions and like no one the, I always find that so, so funny everything because, that the first part of the game <laughs> throw it out the window completely. I, I find that so funny because that's just a clear sign that no one has made it to the end. <laughs> the end of the game it's like uh like there's so many games like that like like your crisis you know it's everyone remembers the jungle areas no one remembers when you actually like you have to fight the the squids like the aliens no one remembers that part because barely anyone got to that part one of my favorite games metal arms mm. no one remembers the damn space levels i find it funny how like even half-life this timeless gem still has that the issue of the last levels being like because more often than not, those are the last levels being rushed, finished, before the game is shipped. Gordon Freeman in the flesh. What a ride. And then you get the, the famous ending with G-Man. To this day... It is confusing what's even going on and what's happening, and you're kind of did, given did, a choice, but not really. Did and you accidentally stay on the train too long? Because that happened to me on my first playthrough. I don't remember. I've 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 always known the two different endings. I always, I always accept the uh, I always accept the job. I I accidentally didn't accept the job my first time because I wanted to like kind of look around and take a look. You know. Have you seen the ending to Freeman's Mind? Honestly, I was trying to catch it before this interview. <laughs> there, he, there's a bonus ending. Give it a watch. And they have authorized me to offer you a job. They agree with me that you have limitless potential. I, it was kind of weird to go from this very beautiful, tight, you know, oh, we're in the sewer system of this place. Now we're in the radioactive reactor, too. Hey, you're in a city. Hey, you're under the sewers. Hey, get the fuck out. You're now in Bad Town. Do like I understand the set pieces, but I felt like part of the sequel, and I love too. It lost a bit of its focus, but with that became a lot of freedom to fuck around with the gravity gun. Yeah, I need to replay two. It's been a while. Two um, is to, to like fully weirdly ble- rough. Fully beat it. Here's a, here, and here's the thing. I love two. I do. But there's so many sections where I'm like, really? That's a fucking thing. Going back to like how the internet their opinions will change. I've seen now a lot of people who are insistent that Half-Life 2 is not as good as Half-Life 1. That Half-Life 1 is a superior game. Um, I guess my response to that would be that they're just, they're two different games. They're like, different games. No, that's, that's it. different that. things. Two's, ge- one's gameplay is frantic when it wants to be frantic. Like, yes. when you're in a firefight, it's literally t- almost Twitch play level. It is, like- it is. It, it genuinely is, like the, the combat is very, very fast uh, faster than even two one sorry two feels a little slow at points not that that thing said though there are a lot more fun ways to play it like yeah. oh no they threw a grenade gravity gun get the fuck out like, it, exactly like picking picking stuff up yeah more focus on the physics it's definitely a slower game the the ai has definitely taken an impact combine you know they're they're not as fun as the soldiers. Even the combat itself, it's not doesn't have the impact that Half Life One has. Like the gun, the guns are just not there for me. But like, but seriously, like the Half Life Two, like, it was very clearly trying to trying to show off the Source engine. That was that was its focus. And again, that is Valve. Is they want to outdo themselves. They want to they want to show off their new toys. They want to show off their new features. I do think a lot of that's a lot of Half-Life 2's, not even like losing its luster, but just kind of feeling dated, is that the Source Engine has been pushed to its absolute limits. We have seen insane things done with it. Not to say anything bad about Half-Life 2, but it is, you know, revisiting it. It's clear like, oh, they're very, they're working with very limited tech. Like they're, they're working with 
that engine as it was when it was when still it just being, when it was still being prototyped because like technically the how the source engine wasn't fully finished like until years later like there are very different versions of source like half-life 2 has changed every every update to the source engine it's like it's felt slightly differently so like as weird as it is like the version of half-life 2 that we can play now is slightly different to the version that released smart fucking game in all aspects and again very smart i just I just love the aliens because it's that era where aliens could just be whatever, but it had to make relative sense to fight. It was definitely on the border of aliens could be, aliens could still be goofy. Like they yeah. were fun to fight, but they were still like, let's have a three legged dog with a giant eyeball or and it, and a, uh, it, it yells at you <laughs> angrily to kill you. A little two-legged guy with a bunch of tentacles who spits goo at you. It's like, all right, that's, that's an alien. Okay. I got to remember. That the design, even the design of the head crab, like, doesn't really make sense when you think about it. This one, so presumably there are some alien species that has a head the size of a human that it can control. Because we've never, we've never seen a head crab take over like a Vortigaunt. Yeah. But we all, we've seen them take over humans. So like, are what are, what do they do in their natural habitat? The first, what were the, what's the big fucking guy? I can't remember the name when you, it's got the uh, rocket Gonarch. launcher. Yeah. Gonarch? Jesus Christ, that she's, is an alien design. And she's spinning out the little, uh, the little baby head crabs, which are fucking disgusting. The little, yeah. little spiders crawling at you. That everything about that was, I was like, this is where I am for what I expect to be like a good <laughs> boss fight. I, I was so hyped for it. <laughs> when you're shooting at the the giant testicle. Yeah. Well, where else are you gonna hit it? Half Life is a series I've always loved in general and it is kind of a, a shame that it just had to end on such a, a kind of a bummer note initially and then on a hopeful note but we're gonna have to wait for literally the next new game console type to like because it took vr becoming prominent for them to be like okay we'll make something again so i'm just trying to think what else could you, could you really do for a to top it off or you know it is also we've said it before for a different valve series it's okay to just let it rest. It is okay to let a game series just rest. And I, we're different, though. That's the problem. Is we, me and you, we like old games. And we recognize that an old game hopefully will always be there. Although as time has marched on, the answer is starting to be a little, a little less clear. But old games from a certain generation and older. Like, those games will always still be there. There is definitely a type of gamer who is a little younger. Who will only play the newest stuff and that's that's just how it is there was that playstation leak that happened where they tried playstation was uh, suing sony was suing microsoft to not acquire activision and they uh, forgot to censor some of their statistics that they brought into the court and it turned out that there are like millions of players who only play call of duty and just call of duty or fifa like just one game forever and it's the newest game and there so you got to remember there are people like that and like again, we were joking about remakes and remasters, and there are people who are just not content with playing an old game. The, it, the game has to be new. It has to have graphics. It has to art. Burke. It has to have RTX, and it has to have a battle royale, and it has to have all this stuff. There are people who genuinely cannot handle an older game, and I th I think that is why there's always a rush of people who want Valve to keep putting out content. And like they're they they finally are. There was a dark period of time where Valve were not making games. It's like right after Portal 2. Yep. Right up until Alex. No, Dota 2 and that fucking card game don't count. Those aren't real games. But they're Especially just... Especially Dota. And But now we're finally getting it. And now, like, they're making Counter... Literally, they're making Counter-Strike 2. And it's showing off the Source 2 engine. Because I'm not into Counter-Strike, but I am interested in Source 2. And I'm excited with all the new features of that game, which we can see in both Alex and Counter-Strike 2. The, the, the released builds of it. I'm excited to see what happens with this tech, and I'm excited to see where Valve is going to go from here. A part of me is pessimistic. A part of me is like, Valve, they're just they're they're going to keep focusing on their multiplayer games. Maybe they'll do more VR stuff. Who really knows? And a part of me worries about that future for them. But a, a, another part of me kind of considers the fact that Valve is different because they are like financially they are different to a Microsoft. Like, again, when I talk about Halo, the reason Halo is never going to change is because Microsoft is stuck where they are. They're stuck trying to make as much money as they can because they have they have investors to answer to. They're a multi-trillion dollar company. 
Valve, you know, they make a lot of money, but they don't have investors to answer to. They don't have stockholders. They are able to make whatever they want, whenever they want. And that gives me a tiny little bit of hope in thinking that maybe they are, maybe we will get a proper Half-Life sequel and maybe it will be good. There's, there's a good chance it might be good. And who knows, I'm excited to see whatever Valve can bring us. I hope, I hope Source 2 is a sign that they are going to get back into making games. I hope, a part of me really hopes that, but you never know. My only counterpoint is you don't make a whole new Source engine and be like, yeah, we're making one game with it. Unless you're Valve. Two games, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless that one game is a is a sequel to Counter Strike Go, like it's it's right. very uh, likely. Literally fair. Part of that makes me wonder what if there is to be a Half Life game. What is it going to be? Because Half Life Alex, you know, spoilers. Yeah, that ending very much teased that Half Life Three is coming. It, it, they would not make that elaborate of an ending if there was no plan to make another Half Life game. Like just straight up, like, hey, remember that cliffhanger from Episode Two? Let's flip it. And now it's like, it's like, wait, wait, what? Like, wait, wait a minute. What? What has happened to these characters? We're doing this. And Valve, they know what they're doing. They know what they're teasing. Wisely done, Mr. Freeman. I will see you up ahead. I'm wrapping things up back around with Half-Life. Considered to be the pinnacle, uh, not even the pinnacle, but the foundational FPS. One of the best FPS games ever made. Do you think it's still considered that? I don't think you can deny it. Do you think it's still as prolific, though? That's my question. Compared to the rest of the things in its history, yes. 1998's a very fucking wild year for gaming. <laughs> and when you compare it to everything else, I think, yes, maybe... No, I can't think of anything else. I think it's one of the grandfathers. I think it is a pillar of what we consider standard FPSs. And a gold standard. <laughs> the gold source standard. <laughs> yeah a part of me always is wondering like has half-life ever lost its relevance i it definitely picked up again with alex and alex was the the heart the 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 heartbeat it was oh this thing's still alive and i've always i've always wondered just how people think about half-life now because when i was getting into pc gaming half-life was the game it was you know, you couldn't call yourself an FPS fan if you hadn't played Half-Life. It was, and as a result, you know, it's a low graphics game. So a lot of people with really crappy computers or laptops like me. Toasters. That was one of their, one of the first sort of formational PC games. Like a lot of my early PC gaming history is on the Gold Source engine. Like with Half-Life and the games that were based off of Half-Life, they're, they're derived from it. It's interesting to consider, like there was a period of time where it was the foundational FPS, where everyone referred to it as the best FPS game ever made. And I've just, I've definitely, and it just might be me, but I've, I've definitely seen that kind of subside in recent years. The last generation of gaming, it's kind of faded away. I, I guess I, I will leave this to the comments of people who are probably younger than me. Is Half-Life still regarded as that pillar? Or is has it shifted to another game? Has it moved on? So I'm very curious to know. Because Half-Life to me is still... Every time I revisit it, I fall back in love with it. And it's it's one of those games that I, every time I replay, I'm like, this is genuinely like one of the best games ever made. And it's not only is it one of my f most favorite games, most cherished games, it's probably one of the most influential just FPS game ever. But yeah. I think that's well said. Fucking go play Half-Life. It's like a buck. <laughs> that's true. You can, <laughs> you, can, you can buy like the whole Steam, the whole Valve bundle for like... What is it, like 16 bucks when it goes on sale? Yeah, or like, for I mean, if you want a Yar Har Har, fucking go for it. Like, <laughs> I will say, do not buy the Source version. Play the original. Yeah. Don't play Half-Life Source. The only good thing about Half-Life Source is that the menu is kind of cool. I do like how it renders the menu in real time. But that's it. Do not, do not play Source. The Source remake is weird, and it breaks a lot of stuff. So stick with the original. I, I'm just saying, beat the game, then you can talk shit. If you wish to criticize the game that's, then maybe, that's where maybe I've play always... black mesa maybe play that as well those they all worked so hard on that game <laughs> they did i remember when that was like they've been working on a game since like half-life 2 came out that's <laughs> that's how long development has been was th this is a, a tangent and it's very quick was half-life black mesa the one with the interview with the sound designer where they're like if you like this one specific noise please thank my wife because it was me slapping her butt when it was wet 
to make that noise. I have no idea, but I love that story. <laughs> I, I remember the, the audio design process, and I was like, I, as someone who worked in a sound design group for a theater company for five years, yeah, yeah we did weird shit like that, so it, it just sticks in my head forever when I hear something like that. Yeah, the guy had a wife who sounded awfully like G-Man. 